Hi there, today we're going to talk about the germ theory of disease. So in the early times, before the 1800s, so 1700s, 1600s, medieval times, disease was really thought to be associated with misdoings. If you do something wrong, you will be punished. Your God will punish you. If you have a miscarriage, you likely did something to offend your God. Um, the idea is that microbes or germs cause disease or can cause a miscarriage was unthinkable, pretty much because microbes were not really understood or known back then. So remember, this is a long time ago. We're just starting to realize that, you know, life comes from life. So the germ theory of disease didn't really come about until about the mid-1800s from the time that Pasteur was solving um, spontaneous generation and a lot of other things. In the mid-1800s, scientists started discovering that microbes are the causative agents of a lot of our diseases. Um, the ma major players in this discovery were Edward Jenner, Agostino Bassi, Robert Koch, Joseph Lister, and Louis Pasteur. We're going to talk about each of these individuals. So let's talk about Pasteur. Pasteur initially was asked by some wine merchants, um, vendors who were having trouble with their alcohol. Wines and um, beer were souring. And he was asked to figure out what was going on. And he's a good scientist and they said, well, you know, we don't know what's going on. But what they believed was that the air converted sugar to alcohol. So they sat their alcoholic beverage, you know, into or their beverage, grapes, whatever it was, in an environment where air could get in so that they could then um, produce their sweet wines. When Pasteur studied the beverages, he found that it wasn't um, air but yeast, which are single-celled eukaryotic microbes that were responsible for the conversion of, of the fruits into the alcohol. And so what happened was um, they took the sugar, the yeast would take sugar and convert it into an alcohol in a process known as fermentation. But this process is an anoxygenic or anaerobic process. So you don't want oxygen or air to get in. In the presence of air, once you had produced the beer or the uh, wine, the bacteria from the air could get in and would convert the alcohols into acetic acid or vinegar, and that became very sour. So he was able to help the merchants. He explained, first of all, keep your alcohol in an anaerobic environment. And then before you um, cook or before you uh, ferment, let's boil the material. So he heated up very fast to kill any bacteria that were in the solution. And then he cooled it off. And this is where pasteurization comes into play. So he produced the process of pasteurization, which is probably one of his most famous um, activities in history and we use it still today to pasteurize milks alcohols juices and to keep um, and this keeps these um, materials safe and fresh for longer periods So learning about spoilage microbes caused scientists to now start thinking about how microbes, you know, if they can cause um, alcohols to go bad, maybe they can also do damage to other organisms like plants or maybe even animals. And in 1835, before we knew that microbes were the causative agents of disease, um, Agostino Bassi was studying um, silkworms. So this is Agostino Bassi right here, and this is a nice healthy silkworm. 
And what he did was he noticed that some silkworms that had a disease had this like fur coat around them. And that fur coat was caused by a fungus. If he put, so the fungus, I'll just tell you, um, is produced by, or that fur coat, I should say, is produced by Bovaria bassiani. And the disease that, so this form of silkworm disease is called white muscardine. And so when he took these diseased Mike or um, silkworms and put them in with the healthy silkworms, the healthy silkworms became diseased. And so um, he was able to determine that this fungus was causing disease. In 1865, Pasteur was called in again and he was asked to do some research because silkworms were getting sick and dying again, and so this was hurting the silk industry. Um, Pasteur looked at Bassey's research, and he, he then, using that research, was able to determine that this form of silkworm disease was caused by a protozoan known as Nosema bombysis, and this disease is known as pebrine. He then developed a technique to determine the difference between a healthy moth, silkworm moth, and the afflicted moths that would produce larvae with the disease. In 1860, Joseph Lister used the germ theory to um, increase safety of medical procedures. So prior to this, washing hands wasn't even an idea that um, doctors had. They might wash their hands if their hands looked dirty, but they weren't gonna wash their hands between one patient and another patient. They didn't wash their hands when doing surgical procedures. So I have two different uh, pictures here of surgical procedures. Here's a patient being sewn up, and here's a patient having his leg amputated. Um, not only did they not use um, techniques to produce cleanliness or techniques to decrease disease. They also didn't use a lot of um, anesthetizing agents. So oftentimes you would have to drink a lot of alcohol or they might just hit you over the head to knock you out and then they would start their surgical procedure. But people often died. Um, Lister used research done by Ignatius Semmelweis, who studied infants in an obstetrics unit. And what he noted was that physicians that washed their hands tended to have healthier offspring and moms. So their babies that were born were healthier than physicians that didn't wash their hands. And he, this led to the idea that germs can be spread through touching. So if you have some germs on your hand, you can spread them to someone else. And what Lister did was he came up with a carboxylic acid machine. Um, this, this holds carbolic acid, and with boiling water, the um, acid is then sprayed into the environment. They, he would spray wounds that um, surgical wound sites. He would spray the surgical environment. He would spray the surgical machinery, so scalpels, knives, needles. Um, and he uh, caused people or started um, stressing the importance of hand washing. And this was um, one of the first findings that proved that microbes do cause disease because when um, physicians started using this process, this carboxylic acid machine, um, their patients were a lot healthier and ended up not dying near as often. So this brings us to Robert Koch. Um, he is the first individual that brought proof that specific diseases are caused by specific bacterial species. 
and this was in 1876. So Koch was a German physician who was trying to determine what caused the disease in anthrax, which was killing a lot of sheep and cattle. And what he noticed that all the cattle that died from the disease had this bacillus-shaped bacteria in the blood. And if he dissected any animals that did not have the disease, they didn't have the, some, the same bacteria. So he took and isolated the bacteria and then he injected it into healthy animals. And when he did that, the animals got sick with anthrax and died. He then looked at their blood and he found the same bacillus-shaped bacteria. And we know now that the bacillus-shaped bacteria happened to be bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax. Um, he was able to isolate the same bacteria, and this is how he determined that specific bacteria cause specific diseases. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. Um, Koch's postulates are still used today. So we use them uh, to determine diseases. They're not foolproof. There are some problems with them. But in general, they help us to solve a lot of problems when we're trying to figure out what's causing these diseases. So now that we know that microbes can cause disease, and um, we know that treatments, or we know that we need to find treatments for the diseases, um, as we're discovering the different diseases, we're also discovering different treatments. And some of the treatments that we used were more preventative. Instead of actually treating the disease, they prevented the disease from occurring. And sometimes these preventative measures were found before we even knew what was going on, like that, that certain microbes were causing disease. So this brings me to Edward Jenner which is this wonderful looking young man over here. Um, Edward Jenner was studying smallpox. So he was a scientist, he was a doctor, and he knew that smallpox was just devastating populations. In England, um, it was wiping out large groups of individuals. And what he also noticed was that though smallpox, which is highly contagious, it, um, it didn't seem to affect milkmaids. So when he looked at the women who would get the milk on dairy farms, they never got sick, even if they came in contact with a patient who had smallpox. Jenner also, um, had a young apprentice named James Phipps, who was an eight-year-old boy who was working with him. And the idea, he was an apprentice back then, um, if you were not a well-to-do family, then your child would probably not be a well-to-do either. So the only way to get your child to have a better status in life was to allow him to move with um, in with someone else, an apprentice from them. Edward Jenner took on a, an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps. And so this boy would apprentice with him until he was in his 20s, and then he would become a doctor and would have a much better life. But while being an apprentice, Jenner could use him for whatever he wanted. There were no child laws back then or anything. So he noted that these milkmaids who never got smallpox did sometimes come down with a different disease called cowpox. It was a much more mild disease. And so I have a figure or a picture here of a little boy with smallpox. And then here's a picture of a little boy with cowpox. So this is much more mild. Um, both cause fever, both cause um, discomfort. This one is much more mild discomfort than this one. Um, smallpox is deadly, and if you don't die from it, you can be severely disfigured from it. So it's a very debilitating and devastating disease. So Edward Jenner took his 
young apprentice, and he took a needle that had um, infected materials from a patient with cowpox. He then scratched the boy's arm with that infected needle. And a few days later, the boy came down with cowpox, of course. And he ran through, you know, was sick or ill for a week, and then he got better. So once he was over the cowpox, Jenner then did the second part of the experiment. He took another needle, infected it with lesions from cowpox, or from smallpox, I'm sorry. And then he took the smallpox pus and again cut the child's arm with the needle and infected him with smallpox. And then he waited. So at this point, you have this eight-year-old child who may or may not come down with this debilitating disease. And lucky enough, he did not. And so this allowed Jenner to say, okay, I have a preventative measure. You don't want to get smallpox, infect yourself with cowpox. At this point, they didn't really know what, what the um, infection from cowpox did. Um, we know today that what he was doing was, was a process known as variolation, where you're infecting yourself with a different disease to protect yourself from um, smallpox. And he didn't know why either. He just knew that it, it worked. And initially, a lot of people thought he was crazy. But by 1798, those people that were teasing him or making fun of him um, were now using his procedure to protect themselves. Oh, wait. There should be one more picture. Hold on. Oh, I lied. Okay, I didn't put it on here. I'm so sorry. Um, so, 80 years later, so in the, again, mid-1800s, about 1860s, Pasteur is a very busy scientist. I should have put a picture for this, and I, I apologize for not. He was working with another scientist named um, Emile Raux. And what they were doing was they were working on chicken cholera. So cholera is the severe disease that causes um, really bad diarrhea. Um, it, can, it can kill you. You just dehydrate and die. Um, caused by bacteria known as Vibrio cholera or cholera. And so they were trying to figure out how cholera worked and, you know, maybe come up with some type of prevention. And like any scientist, you know, when they're working, they have to sometimes have time off and they left their lab. And they were gone for a week or two. And when they came back, they grabbed their bacteria from the incubator and they just started up infecting chickens again. But, and initially, the chickens that were infected before they went on their um, vacation, when they got infected, they would die. So these new chickens, when they infected them, they didn't get sick. And they thought, okay, the bacteria are just too old. So what will we do? We will reinfect them with fresher bacteria. So they um, produce some fresher bacteria inoculated new plates, got some fresh bacteria, and the next day they infected them with the fresh bacteria and nothing happened. And so then they got some new chickens and infected them with the same fresh bacteria. And those chickens got sick and died. And they realized what they had done was they had prevented chickens from getting ill by using attenuated bacteria or old bacteria that can no longer cause infection. And this is where the first vaccine um, came about. They learned, hey, if you take attenuated pathogens, then you can actually protect yourself from the disease. 
they called it a vaccine in honor of Edward Jenner because Edward Jenner really came up with the first idea of a vaccine, um, but he didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't know what was causing the disease or anything because they didn't even know about microbes in the 1700s. But the term vaca means cow, and so it was kind of an honor of Edward Jenner that, that they called it a vaccine. So this ends the germ theory of disease, and I will talk later about the new age of microbiology. Bye.